Hi girls, you may remember me from the library. <laughs> Some of you? Some. Some of you. Okay. Um, I met Elisa Dulo through a uh, HALA group that I run. Yeah, I have 400 members that bake weekly for people who have illnesses or they don't have children. And it's very interesting how your life leads you to meeting people. And if you're awake and you see the opportunity that you have to, to meet special people, you get to know incredible, incredible people. So Aliza joined the group and we started the communicating for some reason. And she led me to her site and I read her story and uh, she's going to talk to you about it. Uh, uh, Elisa converted to Judaism at the age of 16, and for the last 25 years, she's a Torah teacher, extremely inspiring, and we brought her here to, so you can see a, a little bit about the side of somebody who chooses to, to have and live a life that we were given for free. You know, we, we were just born with it, and take it for granted, and what is it, the story and the process of somebody who chose to leave this path. So I hope you enjoy her. Hi. Um, okay, so I guess this is your Parsha space, right? So let's start with that. This week's Parsha is Lech Lecha, and Lech Lecha means go into yourself. When my girls learned um, Chumash in the mornings, they would, um, when they were young, they touched into it. Hebrew and then into English. So they would sing, and I, I remember the Lech Lecha sing song, Lech Lecha, Lech Lecha, go to yourself. So um, Lech Lecha really is about going to yourself, and this is a parsha where Abraham separates from his past and goes into his future. Who knows how many times it says Lech Lecha in the whole Torah? Excellent. Where? <laughs> where? Oh, I gave it. Excellent. What is what is something that you could see as a connection between this week's parsha, this lech lecha, and that lech lecha? What connects them? Abraham. Okay, Abraham. Good. They're both Abraham. Yeah. Well, they're both things that really require a lot of sacrifice, meaning Abraham to give up his whole life and then move, and then that be told to give up your son, and he automatically does it. There's nothing that not easily done. Excellent. What else? Yeah. Past to the future. Good. Excellent. I mean, really. Okay, so let's just think about it. Those are the bookends of Abraham's ten tests. Right? This is the first test, leave behind your past. And that was the last test, let go of your future. Right? So that you're really in the middle, really in the presence, living with Hashem, without where you come from, and without where you think you're headed, but just moving to a space of trust and relationship that's in the moment without out what you think or where you think you came from, right? That's really what Lech Lecha is about, is go into yourself. And certainly as seniors, that's where you're headed. That's what high school is all about. So that's what I was all about. I was a little precocious. I started at age 10. Um, really, I was not going to this class child. <laughs> I think I became nicer. But um, I'm a 13th generation American. My family came in 1634 from England to Raleigh, Massachusetts. <laughs> So, and I know who came too. It was Captain Samuel Brocklebank um, who came on that boat, and I actually went to his house in Massachusetts and got to see. So I'll just give you one little vignette of a difference between Jews and non-Jews, right? So I go to the I go to Raleigh, Massachusetts to see his house, and it's a museum now, the Brocklebank Museum, and it has a little sign on the door. You know, we're open Sundays and Wednesdays from 12 to 3. If you want to see the museum at another time, go across the street to the hardware store and get the key. Okay, so I go across to the hardware store to get the key, and my husband says, you know, we want to see the museum because my wife is a brothel thing. So the guy in the, in the hardware store says, me too, and he hands me the key. I'm thinking, guy, you should come. Like, really? If it were Jews, he'd say, you are? We're cousins! How are we related? Right? But there's just like, me too, here's the key. So, <laughs> so when Miriam um, Greenhouse said, something that you got for free, I will take exception to that. Because the truth is, you didn't get Judaism for free, right? Not at all. You're born into it, but not for free. Because another big difference of Jews by choice and Jews by birth is history, right? So history of Jews by birth is a long, complicated, difficult, painful history. 
choose by choice, just happily go luckily, choose right and say, Hashem, I love you, you're terrific, I love you, Mitzvahs, let's go. You're moving forward with nothing holding you back, nothing dragging you down, none of that complicated stuff, none of the guilt tripping. One thing I've noticed between Jews, Jews by choice from Catholic backgrounds and Jews by choice from Protestant backgrounds, there's a big difference, so I come from a Protestant background, we don't have guilt in Protestant. Catholics have it, so they're really good at moving right into Jewish culture. They can lay guilt trips, no problem. It took me until I had teenagers to realize there's this like whole tool that I'm leaving untapped. Right? I have to learn how to lay guilt trips on my children. Like otherwise, how will they grow up to be proper Jewish children? So, <laughs> so, so, so at ten, right? My parents were not particularly religious Protestants, but really felt that we should have the Protestant experience of being raised in this country, that's the language of this country and the history of our family. And so for that reason, we should be involved in church activities. So we went every week. And finally at 10, I said, no, I don't believe in this. I'm not going. I refuse to go. Now 10, I was the oldest. 10 is just the age where can you be left home alone or not? Like it's right in between. Maybe not today. At that time it was. And so my parents didn't know what to do with me. Should they leave me home when they went to church by themselves or should, or did they force me to go or did they have to get a babysitter? What should they do? Anyway, I got left home alone. So off they went, and now I'm sitting home. I'm victorious in proclaiming my atheism, and I really put up quite a big fight with them. And But as they're gone, I start to think to myself, okay, if I'm atheist, and I don't believe in God, how will I have meaning in my life? How will I have community in my life? How will I have holidays? How will I have ceremony? How will I have structure to my calendar? Like, I'm really thinking about all this stuff, so I'm wondering. So I said, okay, I know my rights. My parents were totally into civil rights. And they heard um, Dr. Martin Luther King speak when I was a little, very little girl, and it transformed them, and they really dedicated their lives to um, creating equality and equality of opportunity, working in the public schools, and making sure that everybody had equal opportunity for advancement and um, inherent dignity of every human being. So I was raised in a house with a very strong sense of equality and fairness and justice. And, that there is injustice and that we should try to create it. So I had such a strong feeling on understanding that there was injustice that in my Dachkinic younger self, I refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the play because I knew there was freedom and justice for all. And I was not saying Shekin. So <laughs> I wouldn't say it. That was the beginning of every day. And I wouldn't say it because it wasn't true. It really bothered me. So um, anyway, I'm now sitting around thinking, how will I find something? And I thought, I have rights too. Just because I don't believe in God doesn't mean I don't have rights to be part of a group of people that have a religion or meaning in their lives. So I'm going to seek uh, some kind of religion that's God-free. Right? I was 10. So I didn't really know that much about that. I started to look around for different ways to connect to people or meaning or something without God. So I tried Scientology, and I tried Buddhist chanting, and I tried psychic healing, and chakra workshops, and all kinds of different things. Um, 10, 11, 12. I still didn't find what I wanted, so at 12 I made up my own religion with a girlfriend. Her name was Jenny. My, name's, my English name is Elisa. So we made up Jelsa. We were Jelsonians. We had our whole language. We made a calendar and holidays and outfits we had to wear for the different holidays. The whole thing made up, right? <clears throat> and then my parents went through really the nicest divorce I ever saw on the planet. And we moved from Rochester, New York to Portland, Oregon. So that was back in the day when long distance was really expensive, and I was granted 10 minutes a month to call my friend, and it was really difficult keeping up the religion with two high priestesses 3,000 miles apart, like, just the whole, like, avoided aspect of it wasn't working out so well, and so I started to look into other things on my own, and one day, um, at 14, I had, like, a God experience, I thought, that's weird, because I don't believe in God, how can it be that I'm feeling this, what is that? And I realized that um, maybe I should explore this a little bit more. Maybe I abandoned the whole God concept because of the way that I was raised in it, or that, that picture that I was raised with. <clears throat> maybe I should look and see if there's another concept that I could relate to. So I was a freshman in high school, inner city performing arts high school in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I went down to the library of that high school. This was 1978, so there's no, no, obviously no internet or easy way to explore these things. But my high school had a great religion section in their library, so I just started to read across the shelf. And I got to a book called To Be a Jew. So I took it off the shelf and opened it up. It just like, I knew I slipped into home plate. I had already tried a few different things. I'm like, 
the more I read it, the more I was like, this is so cool. There's holidays, there's a calendar, there's meaning, and there's God, all in one package. Like, I don't have to look anywhere, I don't have to invent anything here, like the whole thing is all set up. And no any Jews. I had met Jews before in my life, but I didn't know any Jews at the time. Um, but I just took that book home, and I started reading it, and I started thinking about it, and it had the Shema in it, and it says, you know, it had the Shema in the first paragraph. So I memorized it in English, and it says in that paragraph, say these words, in the morning, in the evening, when you lie down, when you wake up, so I started saying it in the morning, in the evening, when I lay down, when I woke up, and it says, and write these words upon the doorpost of your house. I'm like, how am I going to do that? I don't have a house, but I had a room. So I took a black magic marker, and on the doorpost of my bedroom, I wrote, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I didn't know what a mezuzah was, but I put that sentence on the doorpost. And um, and the more I learned, the more I loved it. And it took a while. I, I finally did meet a Jew who brought me to a conservative congregation. And at that time, the conservative congregation was very active. They had a full youth program, teen program, a summer camp, an adult education program. And I signed up for everything. I was 15 by then. 15 is like the right age for teen stuff, and just old enough for adult stuff, so I signed up for every single class that was in my schedule. And, um, and the more I learned, the more I loved it. So by the time I was 15 and a half, I went to the rabbi and said, I want to convert. He said, that's cute, but you're too young. So I was like, I mean, I'm too young. I've made the decision. I've thought about it. I've looked into it. I've tried other things. This is what I want. He said, that's nice, but you're too young. But, and I was not used to having some, an adult get in my way I wanted, but I decided what was my choice, the life that I wanted to lead. I felt like he was so holding me back, which he was. Um, so, um, so he said, you're welcome to continue attending our synagogue, but you're too young to convert. So that was frustrating, but that summer, I, um, that summer I, I went to services every week, and um, over the summer, the rabbi wasn't there one time, the cantor gave a whole sermon about... Um, about Jewish continuity and summer camps and how summer camp, the summer camp experience is so important. I remember this conservative congregation where they didn't send their kids to day school, so summer camp is really important. If you want your kids to be Jewish forever, you want your grandkids to be Jewish forever, you must send them to Jewish summer camp, Camp Salman Shechter. I thought, I don't want to be Jewish forever. I need to go to Camp Salman Shechter. So I went to camp and I learned how to keep Shabbos and how to keep kosher. So that's, that's where they did it. And um, it was just a day session and I came home to keep Shabbos as much as I could at home, kosher as much as I could at home. Um, I learned about brachot. I didn't know that many, but I just learned the ones we learned at camp, which was Hamotzi and Bori Bori Gavin. So I knew the translation for Bori Bori Gavin. And so I just made up extra endings. So I would say, I'm fruit, Bori Bori a tree. I'm milk, Bori Bori a cow. You know, like, <laughs> and Bori Bori Gavin worked for every, like, you know, zucchini and watermelon, all the fruits of the vine. Um, so, uh, and I just, so I just made up my own blessings for whatever it was. So I started saying blessings on food. And, um, finally, in the middle of, and I went back to the rabbi and I told him again, I really want to be Jewish. 